Hey everyone, welcome to Awaken Church Online. We're so glad you joined us today. I'm Pastor Leanne. And I'm Pastor Jürgen. And if you're here for the very, very first time, if you're tuning in and you're brand new, would you do this? Would you text Awaken VIP? Awaken VIP to 555-888 because we love first-time visitors and we want to send you a gift. We bribe first-time visitors. So Awaken VIP 555-888. Perfect. And also we want to let you know that we would love for you to stay connected with us during this season. If you can text Find a Connect to 555-888, we want to partner you up with one of the multitude of groups we have happening right across San Diego online, virtually for every age, every stage and season of life. We want to make sure that you stay connected, that we stay in touch with you and we stay strong as a community together. Amen. Yeah, staying connected is everything, especially in this season, especially yes. in this time. Yes, so true. Well, listen, enjoy the service. Can I encourage you, stand up, lean in, yeah. because our worship team have been working so hard. You're going to love the worship. You're going to love the Word. Tonight, I've got a different Word that is worth leaning into again. So come on, let's cross over now. God bless you. Oh, come on, church. Worship with us. Praise with us. And we're going to have so much fun. We're going to have so much fun. Let's go. Let's put our hands together wherever you're at. Let's go. Sure. 
calling my name And I came running home Made you the king over my pain You helped me let it go Now I know that I know that I know That you are for real Cause your love is straight to my heart This is for real going to be sharing around communion right now and so if you could grab whatever you have in your house maybe it's water or juice bread or a cracker and join us um, so the Bible says to do this in remembrance of Jesus's sacrifice on the cross and I just started thinking of you know what it might have looked like on that day when we remember what that day looked like for Jesus you know he had a crown of thorns on his head and the Bible says his beard had been pulled out and they had whipped his body 39 times, just one short of a death sentence. And he hung on that cross and he was unrecognizable. You know, and then the Bible says in John 19, 28 through 30, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. 
I can only imagine being one of the people that followed Jesus, one of his disciples, someone who loved him. And when Jesus said those words, it is finished, I can only imagine what they were thinking. It's finished? Wait, what do you mean it's finished? This can't be the end. What What is going on? I, I can imagine the thing, this doesn't look like it's finished. This, this looks like it's a mess. This looks like loss. This looks like defeat. This looks like despair, like all hope is gone. But what Jesus knew and what they didn't realize is that three days later, Jesus was gonna rise up out of that grave, conquering death and conquering sin, coming out of that grave, completely healed, completely restored and victorious. You know, so I don't know what your current situation may look like. It may look like it's a mess right now. It could look a little bit hopeless. You could feel some despair, but I want to encourage you today, just like Jesus got up out of that grave after three days, so will you. Jesus is in the resurrection business and that resurrection power lives on the inside of us. So right now I wanna encourage you to not look at your current circumstances, see yourself victorious, See your finances and your business resurrected. See yourself completely, everything that has been lost completely restored and see your body healed just like Jesus was. So as we take the bread and we take the juice, I want to declare over you the resurrection power over your lives and over your circumstances. And I wanna to declare today the full weight and the full benefit of the cross over your life and over your circumstances. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your body that was broken for us. God, and I thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Lord, I thank you right now that the resurrection power lives on the inside of each and every one of us. And I thank you, Father God, that we are gonna rise from these circumstances completely restored, completely healed, and completely delivered. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen. God bless you, church.
Hey, Pastor Mike here. We're going to come around a time of tithes and offerings uh, right now. So as you prepare your tithes and offerings, I'll share a quick uh, story with you. You know, about nine months ago, um, I pulled up to a, a meeting um, for a, a potential consulting gig um, and was sitting in my cars a little bit early. And so I thought, um, you know, I'll just pray real quick. I always try to pray before any big business meeting. And I just kind of closed my eyes. And this particular job was a little out of my wheelhouse. I didn't really know uh, how it was going to going to go. And so just kind of closed my eyes. I said, God, if this is from you, I pray for a sign that you would, uh, uh, you know, very clearly confirm it and, you know, da, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. And I opened my eyes, and okay, true story, there was this dove sitting on the hood of my car just staring at me and just was there for a second and then just went and flew away. And I was like, wow, okay, that's cool. So I went in, did the meeting, and, you know, the meeting went okay. It wasn't groundbreaking, and really nothing came of it. Didn't didn't get the project and was like, well, that's kind of weird. I don't know what that was all about. So nine months later, this is just a, a handful of weeks ago, get this random call back from this company that says, hey, we actually want to move forward with this project now. Um, and all of the things that originally had kind of made me a little nervous about about the engagement had totally been ironed out. And, um, and so it was just like, oh, wow, this is this is great. And so we kind of start negotiating on, on price and things like that. And I actually um, sort of made a deal with God. I said, God, if you bring this, this project into our household, I will commit all of it, every penny, to vision builders. And if you don't go to Awaken Church, vision builders is a, uh, a sort of a financial um, uh, thing that we do that's above and beyond our tithes and offerings that really we, we use to take physical ground in San Diego and Salt Lake City where we have campuses already and are believing God for more. And so um, then, uh, sure enough, I, I'm awarded this, this consulting project and get this first kind of big mobilization chunk of money. And, um, and then uh, literally the next day, is when all of this COVID-19 stuff started. So um, I, I had this this kind of money in, in our bank account, and I remembered that I had made this oath before the Lord that I was going to give it all to vision builders. But surely, right, I mean, you know, it's crazy times. Surely God will understand. I mean, I can hang on to it for a little bit, just kind of see what's going to happen. And then, but but I God reminded me, just kind of like he was tapping me on the shoulder, like, hey, remember what you said? And so my wife and I, we prayed and knew that God was, was, um, was telling us to sow that seed. You know, and we talk a lot about, about seed and harvest. And, you know, there's three ingredients for a harvest. You've got to have seed, you've got to have sunshine, and you've got to have water. Those are the ingredients for photosynthesis, seed, water, sunshine. And God actually provides all three of them. God provides the seed. God provides the sunshine. God provides uh, the rain. But you know what? It's the farmer who has to put the seed into the ground. It doesn't matter how much rain, how bright the sun is shining. doesn't matter how much the rain is falling. doesn't matter how fruitful the seed is, if the farmer doesn't put it into the ground, there is no chance of a harvest. And so we knew that we needed to sow that seed. And even though conventional wisdom would say, hey, hang on to it, you know, let's just see what happens. We went ahead and we sowed every penny of that consulting gig to Vision Builders. And almost immediately we saw this miraculous unlocking of all kinds of things. Like I had to buy this expensive piece of equipment for my business. And because of all of this uh, COVID stuff going around, I got incredible turns. I got an unbelievable deal on this piece of equipment. We saw um, some of our expenses just go way down, uh, favor with, with, with some of that stuff, and, and, and our income was protected. And so we just saw this incredible provision of God as we sowed that seed, even in the midst of uncertainty. So I just want to encourage you that, you know, the conventional wisdom may say, hey, why don't you don't give right now. You can give later. Let's just be. Sp-. No, you need to put that seed in the ground because God cannot bless seed that is not in the ground. So let me pray for us, and let's take up a great offering in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the gift of giving, God, that you have given us this mechanism by which we can exercise our faith in you. I pray that you would bless every giver here today, God. Your word promises that you will open up the windows of heaven over our life if we would bring our tithes into the storehouse. So we believe it, we declare it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be with you guys today at Awaken Church. Uh, whether you're in San Diego, Salt Lake City, or joining in from right around the world, am I so glad that you're here with us. You know, right now we're coming out of what was our quarantine. Very interesting, the quarantine comes from the Latin 40. And God regularly in the Bible shut things down for 40 days, 40 days, 40 nights. And 40 is always symbolic of a new beginning, something new coming out of something old. And 40 was a quarantine period. Uh, as right now our leaders have shut down uh, businesses and schools and 
pretty much any kind of public thoroughfare, a lot of people have been misplaced and even displaced in society. And you may be concerned and you may be upset. Well, boy, do I have a word for you. I want you to know that God is very, very good at recovery. The Bible says you shall lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. Uh, the Bible says that Elisha, when, they, when he died, they buried him in a tomb. That year there were Moabite raiders and one of them died in battle. And so they, they threw him into this cave because they didn't have time. And it just happened to be the cave where they buried Elisha. The Bible says this dead corpse rolled down on top of the bones of Elisha and there was enough anointing in the bones of Elisha for this dead man to revive, to recover and climb back out of that tomb and continue fighting. God is a God of recovery. And the title of my message today is The God of Recovery. So come with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Just for time's sake today, I'm going to abbreviate the story and then land on certain scriptures. But the story basically goes that David and his men were out on raiding bands. That's what they were doing. And they returned back to Ziklag where they were living. When they get back to Ziklag, the Amalekites had burnt their city. So while they were out, the enemy, the Amalekites had come in and attacked their homes, their families, their marriage and their children. When they came back, these men exhausted, there they saw their homes on fire, burning embers, smoke going up. As they raced around, their wives and their children were taken captive. You know, the enemy, while you're trying to just do your best in the marketplace, he'll attack your marriage, he'll attack your home, he'll attack your family. I want you to know that that is a signature that the enemy's at work. Salvation comes to you and your entire house. Your entire house is the welfare of not just your marriage, not just your home and its possessions, but also everybody who lives under that covering, under that authority. That's your wife, that's your children, that's your, your posterity, that's your prosperity. And you need to understand that the enemy will occupy territory that you do not realize God has given for you to push him back. So the Bible says when they, they come back, they find Ziklag burnt to the ground, their wives and their children taken captive. The Bible says all the men lifted up their voices and they wept till they had no more strength. And then in verse five, it says that uh, they took David's two wives, Ab Abigail and Ahinoam. And verse six, it says, now David was greatly distressed because his men spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was so grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. So watch this, all the men who have lost their homes, who have lost their wives, who have lost their loved ones, they're all grieving, hurting people hurt people. And isn't it interesting, the first thing they wanna do is they wanna stone the leader. How many people know that stoning David isn't gonna bring your house back? Stoning David isn't gonna bring your wives and your children back, but but they were just so mad, they were so angry, they were so wounded, they were so hurt, they were so dejected at the fact that they lost their homes, they lost their... We live in a season right now where it's very, very easy to cast blame. It's very, very easy to throw stones, but you know what, throwing stones and laying blame doesn't help you. So David, the Bible says now, goes and he puts on a linen ephod and he inquires of the Lord and he says to the Lord, Lord, Shall I pursue? Shall I go after them? And the Bible says the word of the Lord came to David saying, pursue for you shall surely recover all. Pursue, you shall surely recover all. Well, the next thing David does is he goes back and he gets his 600 men. 200 were so exhausted. They said, man, we can't, crook the, we can't cross the brook Bezor. So we're going to stay on this side and we'll, we'll look after the supplies and make sure that nobody circumnavigates you, that the enemy doesn't flank us and now take the rest of our goods. So we'll stay back here and we'll guard the goods. So 400 men went with David across the book Bezor. The Bible says as they cross the book Bezor, they find an Egyptian servant, an Egyptian slave, abandoned, lying in a field, pretty much dead. And so they, they came to him and they brought him 
uh, bread and cakes of raisins and oats and, and they brought him fruit and fresh water and juice. And when they brought them to him, he ate and he drank and his strength came back to him. He revived. And they said, who are you? He said, well, I was the slave of an Amalekite. And that slave, when I became sick, just left me to die, abandoned me here in this field. And David said, do you know where they've gone? He said, yes, I know where they've gone. He said, will you take us down there? The, the, the Egyptian servant said, listen, uh, if I take you down there, they're going to kill me. Promise me that you won't let them kill me. And David says, I promise with an oath that we will protect you. You'll be like one of us. So he showed them where they were. Well, they went down to the Amalekite camp and they snuck up on them and they went after them and they brought such a beating to the Amalekites that not only did they get their wives, their children and all their possessions back, but that day they brought back great plunder because they also plundered the Amalekite enemy and they brought back the silver and the gold and the jewels and all the spoils of the Amalekites. They brought them all back. It was an incredible day. And so what began in the morning as weeping ended up with rejoicing and jubilation. I want you to know God spoke to me about this word and He said, speak this to my people because maybe you're looking at the last six weeks of no, no income, economic loss. You, you've had to shut down parts of your company, parts of your business or there's paychecks that haven't turned up and you're wondering, oh my God, how's my 2020 going to look? And I want you to know today the word is that there is a God who is the God of the recovery. Pursue, you shall surely recover all. So let me give you four thoughts today from what David did. The first thing David did while the men were looking to lay blame, David, who was the leader, took responsibility. Blaming is the language of victims. David decided, I can't be a victim. If I'm going to be a victor, victors take responsibility. So the first thing that David did was he went and drew near to God. How do I draw near to God? Well, the Bible says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. He put on the linen ephod. Can I just encourage you that everybody, when they go through a crisis, turn to something. We know that Samson turned to what took away his strength. He turned to Delilah. He turned to pleasure. He turned to sensuality. And it ended up costing him his vision and costing him his strength. Sadly, one of the great deficits of our 21st century, one of the great ailments in our 21st century is that when people face pressure, when pe people face crises, they turn to drugs, they turn to booze, they turn to alcohol, they turn to all the wrong things. They turn to things that take away their strength. David turned to the Lord. David turned to God. This is the time to turn to God, not to run from God. Go to God. You know, well, you may be saying, I, I, I you know, I'm too sinful, man. I'm, I'm not holy. I'm not, I'm not a good person. You know, God, I don't even think God would listen to me. Friend, can I just tell you, the time to go to church is when you least feel like it. The time to draw near to God is when you feel like you're least qualified. David puts on the linen ephod. I mean, he was responsible for all his men. He was responsible. He had not left adequate provision, supervision and protection over the city. And now his houses were burnt down, not just his, but also the wives of his, uh, the, the, his men and their wives and their children were taken captive. This is not great leadership. But David didn't let that disqualify him. He drew near to God. He went and got a word from God. As you draw near to God, God will speak to you and He'll minister to you. You may say, well, I'm not hearing God. Well, why don't you go back to what was the last thing that God said to you? You know, Peter, Jesus told Peter that before the rooster crows twice, you'll have denied me three times. Jesus, this is the night that He's going to be betrayed. This is the night where they're going to lose Jesus. This is the night where where he is going to be taken away captive. And the next time they'll see him, it'll be hanging on a cross, crucified. And then they take him down from that cross and they put him into a tomb. This is kind of the last stand. And Peter goes out on that last stand, denying Jesus three times. But Jesus gave him a word. He says, Peter, I've prayed for you that your strength would not fail. When you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. God will always speak to you in the light what you need in your season of darkness. 
Let me say that again. God will always speak to you in a season of light what you need in a season of darkness. You may say, hey man, my life is so good. I, I, you know what? Business is good. My marriage is good. My family is good. I don't need to go to church. Friend, let me encourage you. You need to go to church because you'll hear a word in the light that you may need in a season of darkness. So draw near to God. Draw near to God. There's power in God's words. I can't tell you how many times in my own life, in my own family life, that I face crises, I face difficulty, whether it was my firstborn or whether it was my youngest, where they were in a crisis, in a dilemma, a life or death situation. And I went and got a word from God. And the word that God spoke to me helped me to go and pursue, helped me to go and turn the darkness into light, to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. That's what God wants to do with you. So draw near to God. Come onto our podcast, go onto our app, download messages, put on worship, draw near to God. The second thing is God said to David, pursue, pursue, for you shall surely recover all. Can I just talk to maybe some of the religious folk and the Christians who are out there? Sadly, there's a, there's a really bad teaching that, you know, if it's God, it requires zero interaction, engagement or involvement for you. Nothing could be further from the truth. God didn't say to David, David, you sit down, put your feet up. I'm going to do all the heavy lifting and I'm going to bring everything back to you. Just watch. I'm going to bring it all back so that I can get the glory. That's not what God said. God said to David, pursue. In other words, pick up your sword, pick up your bow, rally your men, cross the brook Bezor, chase down the enemy. You need to pursue. A word from God requires work and action from you and I for that word to come to pass. We, when we lived in New Zealand, we lived in New Zealand from uh, end of 91 to the middle of 1998, seven years. We loved New Zealand. They were the, the first seven years of uh, Leanne and I, are, uh, the beginning of our marriage, our beautiful marriage, our life together. They're also, uh, New Zealand was also the place where we had our first two sons, our first two kids. It was a magnificent season. But I remember getting a prophetic word that God was going to give us a home. God was going to give us a home. I didn't sit back on my laurels. I didn't sit back and just say, okay, God, well, we're waiting. God told me, go down to the area that you want the home and begin to pray. Begin to, so we would lay hands on mailboxes and we would prophesy over homes. And it was a battle that, that took many, many twists and turns. But it became a blueprint for how Leanne and I have gotten every other property. I want you to know we've never bought a property that we could afford. We've never bought a property that we could afford. We've never bought a property that was within our reach. Every single property that we have ever purchased, whether it was in Auckland, whether it was in Sydney's Northern Beaches, whether it was in Australia, whether it was in the United States of America, every single property we've ever bought has been out of our reach. We've been going now for 14 years in our church. In 14 years, we have seven properties. When I moved to San Diego, they told me, oh, you can't buy property in San Diego. Number one, there's no zoning for churches in San Diego. Number two, not only is there no zoning, but it's so expensive. It's the third most expensive city in the United States of America. It took me all the way back to the blueprint that God gave me that if, if he'll speak a word and if I'm willing to work, then I'll see that word come to pass. God's word is always pursue. It's always get up. It's always activity. It's always go after the enemy. Christianity is not a passive religion. If it was a passive religion, Paul wouldn't write to us saying, hey, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Do not take up the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. Paul is telling you and, and myself that Christianity is not passive, but it is aggressive, that this is not a fashion statement. This is a warfare that we're engaged in. The armor, he didn't say put on a hat and a ball, a hat and a ball cap and, and uh, put on slippers and sit on the sofa. He said, dress yourself for engagement with the enemy. You'll also notice in Ephesians 6 that the armor has no back on it. It has no, because you're never meant to be in retreat. You're never meant to be running from your enemy, but rather engaging your enemy. 
Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are meant to be ground taking. You are meant to be forward moving. So for some of you, the word of the Lord to you today is pursue, pursue. You got a word from God? Don't pursue till you get a word. Otherwise you're going to exhaust yourself. Wait on God, get a word from God. Once you get on that, get that word, work, put it into action. Number three, now this is a big one. I want you to, to do this. You need to, number three, feed what is foreign in your field. Feed what is foreign in your field. You may say, what, is, what kind of, stu- that is the dumb, what? Well, let me explain it. The Bible says, as they cross the book Bezor, they come and they find an Egyptian, an Egyptian. Remember, they were slaves for 400 years in Egypt. God delivered them from Egypt. But here they find an Egyptian slave abandoned in the field, about to expire, about to die. He was sick, and so Amalek neglected him. Amalek in the Scripture is symbolic of our flesh, our sinful nature. It's interesting, the sinful nature discards things that are an inconvenience. Whatever's an inconvenience, we don't do it. The flesh thrives on immediate gratification. Whatever you neglect dies. If you, if you have a car and you neglect to get it serviced, if you neglect to change the oil and the water and take it to, to, to get regular servicing, you'll find that car will break down. In your marriage, if you neglect your marriage, if you neglect your spouse, you're going to find yourself losing your spouse. If you have a garden and you neglect to water it, you neglect to weed it, you're going to find it breaking down. It's the same with our life. The flesh, whatever is an inconvenience, whatever costs me something, I'm just going to abdicate. Friend, there's a price to everything. Well, the Amalekites, they discard this Egyptian. But when David finds the Egyptian foreigner in the field, David feeds what is foreign in his field. The feeding of that Egyptian gave them the exact location of the enemy. So they were able to not just plunder the enemy and recover all, but they recovered all all with interest. They recovered all with spoil. They recovered all, excuse me, all pressed down, shaken together and running over. You got to feed what's foreign in your field. You may say, I don't even understand what that means. Well, let me explain that. When the shutdown hit and we were no longer to meet in any of our locations, we were no longer able to meet, we had to go to online. The online was, it was in our field, but it was foreign to me. I've never sought to be an online person. I've never sought to, to, to be an a internet star or, or even get, so we kind of tolerated it. We didn't really invest in it. But as soon as this door closed for us to meet, and congregate and gather on a Sunday physically, I had to learn to feed what was foreign in my field. Almost every business that I know had to learn to feed what was foreign. They had to to regroup, they had to reroute, they had to redirect so they could feed what was foreign in their field. Do you know that the definition of an insanity, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over expecting a different result. If that door is shut, Go to an open door. There's an old saying, if the horse is dead, dismount. If that that horse is dead, dismount. God's got something new for you. I remember remember, uh, reading the, the, the story of Henry Ford that in 1904, Henry Ford did a survey and he asked what people wanted, what people were looking for. And the number one answer was faster horses faster horses. They, they, they couldn't get out of an old paradigm. They were stuck in a rut. They were stuck in a dead end street. They had no idea that he's about to start the fuel injected engine, that the automobile, um, uh, uh, something that would be mobile automatically, would drive automatically, was on the cusp of being invented. All they thought of was faster horses. Noah Glass, Jack Dorsey, and Florian Webb had a company called Odeo. They were looking to put a podcasting platform together when they discovered that Apple iTunes were also doing the same thing. And Apple iTunes had millions of dollars that they were 
uh, deploying into the research. So unfortunately, these three guys thought, oh, we may as well scrap all these years of development. Podcasting platform is not us. So they invented instead a way that you could send a text message and all your friends could read your text message, 140 characters. Well, that platform today is known as Twitter. Twitter now has 350 million tweets going out every single day. It became a multi-billion dollar corporation, but it was started because they were looking to do a podcasting platform, realized they couldn't compete with the juggernaut of iTunes, so that door shut. But you know what they did? They had, they had a foreign idea, just a concept that was in their field, within their grasp, and so they fed what was foreign in their field. If you want to get your marriage back, you may, feed, you may need to feed what's foreign to you. You know, when I grew up, I never heard the words, I love you, but I realized if I want a great marriage, I need to do that. When I grew up, my father disconnected from me because he ran away from home. He had an abusive upbringing. But I realized if I wanted to be a good daddy, if I wanted to be a good father, then I needed to learn to feed what was foreign in my field. My dad never engaged. My dad never connected. He never said, I'm proud of you. You did good, boy. He never said, I love you. Man, you're a champion. He never said those words. So I had to feed what was foreign in my field. If you don't brush your teeth, you'll lose them. If you don't floss, you'll lose them. Whatever you neglect, you're going to lose. You have to learn to feed what is foreign. Well, you, well, you don't understand. I wasn't brought up with that. Uh, that. That was never in my home. You've got to feed what's foreign in your field unless you want to repeat the same mistakes as your forebears. Let me give you, let me give you one more. Ben Silberman, ben Silberman worked at Google but was frustrated. He was frustrated because he kept bringing up ideas and they kept getting shut down. No, we don't do that. No, we're not interested in that. One day he's kind of complaining to his girlfriend and she was done. She was done with hearing his whining and complaining. She goes, why don't you, instead of spending all this energy whining and complaining, why don't you take one of your ideas and do something with it? So he felt like that was like a little bit of a kick in the pants. So he did exactly that. He took the ideas that he had and he began to tinker and he began to toil and he began to work on it. Well, he created a platform for photo sharing, for, for pinning photos that you and I today know as Pinterest. And that was born in 2010. Today it is one of the largest and most influential photo organizing sharing websites in the world, largely because of its ability to pin photos or create pin boards organizing them in topics and themes and people all over the world are using them. See, he fed what was foreign in his field. For you, you may have never seen your parents model, I forgive you. That may be foreign, but it may be what's gonna save your marriage. Why don't you start with, I forgive you? What is it? What is it that's foreign in your field? What is, what is in your field? It's in your grasp, but it's foreign to you. You didn't grow up with it. Maybe you're saying, man, I've got, I've got you know, heart disease. I've got diabetes. Man, I, 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 you know, I'm struggling with my weight. Well, maybe you grew up in a home where bad dietary and bad food and bad eating and no exercise was there. Friend, make a decision. This is a season. This is a restart. You can recover all with spoil and with interest, but you've got to learn to feed what's foreign in your field. Foreign means it didn't grow up with you. It was an Egyptian. It didn't grow up with him. But when he fed what was foreign in his field, it led to the enemy, it led to plunder, and it led to their victory. I'd love to pray for you. Listen, today, the most important thing you can do with your life is surrender to Jesus. The greatest thing that ever happened in my life was the day that I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, when He became Lord and Savior over my life. If that's you today, if you're saying, hey, I want to respond, I want to give my life to Christ. I want God to come into my heart. Friend, I want you to do something right now. I just want you to text the words, I responded to the number 555-888. I responded to 555-888. God will step into your world. We'll send you a Bible. We'll send you a following Jesus book. God will come into your life and everything will be different. But let me pray for you today, wherever you're at, I want you to know the word of the Lord to you is that God is the God of recovery and He recovers more than enough. Whatever you've lost, you're gonna get back with interest. Father, I thank you for every viewer watching. 
I thank you, Father, for every person, those who surrendered to Christ, those who are responding to Christ. Father, let them experience the love, the power and the joy of being born again today. I declare sins forgiven. I declare chains of infidelity, dysfunction and destruction broken, addiction broken off people's lives. I declare freedom flows today. Father, those who have lost heart and those who have lost hope, that both heart and hope comes back. Pursue, you will surely recover all. There is something foreign in your field. Feed that and you watch what God will do on the other side. Father, bless these people in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. What a powerful message. I know you agree with me and I feel like that's a prophetic word for us. We surely will recover all. So I'm grabbing a hold of that today. I know you will too. And I just wanna ask you, if you lifted your hand or clicked that button to respond to Jesus after that great message, we wanna make sure that we properly care for you. If you did that, if you made that declaration, I'd love it if you could text, I responded to 555 888 and one of our trained beautiful pastoral people is going to connect with you pray with you and we're going to get you a bible and make sure that we take really good care of you yeah amen and listen now that the service is finished don't think you got to wait a whole seven days stay connected with us online because we got content coming out each and every day. We do a Faith Over Fear every day, yes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 noon. That's right. Leanne has a cooking show. There's a Wednesday night, Empower Night. There's so much great content. Tons There's fireside chats. Yes. We want to make sure that you're getting an injection of faith, hope, and love almost every single day. So tune in with us online tonight. Tune in again. I've got an unbelievable message. You're going to love this message. The God of over and above. It's an incredible Amen. message. God so doesn't good. just forgive your sins. You watch what He does. Tune in tonight. It's going to be worth checking out again. Amen to that. Well, thank you, Jürgen. And I want to tell you next week is going to be Mother's Day. So dads, you have been forewarned. Kids, you have been forewarned. Make sure that you make some plans to spoil mum this week. And then this coming Sunday, I'm going to be sharing a great word for our entire church, all our church and friends on that special Mother's Day to celebrate with everybody. It's going to be a fun Sunday. Uh, but God bless you. We'll see you again tonight. God bless. Bye for now. signs. We can see wonders happening. We can see people filled with the gifts and the power, walking in the anointing, seeing God's transformative, active power in their lives. Marriages restored, families healed, people prospering, people flourishing, people dreaming dreams, seeing vision, prophesying of a day that's not yet. I see every school impacted. We have hundreds of thousands of students right around San Diego, and as yet, there is no prolific and there is no strong voice, but I see a time where on every single campus, Christ is going to be elevated, where we're going to counteract the spirit of humanism and the vain philosophies of men, and we're going to bring the presence of God, the Word of God, the wisdom of God, and the power of God, and we're going to see revivals, streams of students pouring into the house of God, the future Willie Grahams, the future Wigglesworths, the future Finneys and Spurgeons raised up right here. Our church is one of connect, it's one of develop, and one of empower. We want people to to connect with God, connect with each other, connect with the community of God, connect with their God dream, their God vision, and their God purpose. Then we want you to understand that discipleship is development. There's no development without discipleship, and there's no discipleship without development. We are here to disciple you. We are here to develop you. We all need developing. Even Adam, God said, it's not good that man shall be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God was always thinking of shaping. God was always thinking of developing. You need development in your life. Once we develop people, we have a vision to empower people. We want you to be filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to live a powerful life so that literally you live your best life now. We want you to discover your God-designed destiny. 
We want you to fill your God purpose and calling. We want you to live a life that is full of the power of the Holy Spirit above every circumstance. You're not going to be kicked around by the ups and downs, the twos and fros, the vain and the vanishing philosophies of men. You're going to live according to conviction. You're going to live according to passion. You're going to live according to purpose. You're going to live according to the presence and power of the Most High God who lives on the inside of you. The community of the church is the most powerful community and discipleship is the engaging and the interacting of getting your life to where God wants it to be. Awaken church, a church that is a beacon, a church that inspires people, a church that people look to, to find vision, to find guidance, to find direction, and to find life.